So Ben Sullivan is a brother from currently Oregon, but he's also lived many years in Nicaragua with a people group called the Mayangna. His wife is a representative of the Mayangna and working together with some of her family on translation. Uh, ben wants to talk a little bit about the history of the Mayangna Bible and maybe my young missions in general and how that kind of goes together some of the problems um, and the reason why faithful bible translation really matters so i don't know where i'll go with this there'll be a few stories in there and uh we'll take all the time we can give him so god bless you brother looks like you're up okay good afternoon everyone i've Enjoyed being here this year, a bit more than last year, I think, getting used to the venue and the people and everything. <coughs> and um, these, what I'm going to do, you have, an, you have a, um, a little write-up here that I did for, for last year. I'm not going to follow this very closely, so don't, and don't worry about trying to read everything right now. Um, this, this will outline some ideas. The, the focus was a little more the discipleship side of it last year. And um, that's definitely an integral part of it. But it's a broad subject and we can easily emphasize any different aspect and still never do justice to it. Bible translation and church planting kind of covers uh, many areas of, of life, of relationship with God. Maybe all of them. <laughs> So, just a quick little history of the Mayangna people, where they're from. I'm going to count on all of you to be literate and basically read through here at a pretty quick rate. I'm not really going to read everything for sake of time. Misu Malpan language family. It's considered like an isolate language family. Um, linguistically, nobody's managed to keep their theory up long enough for it to be connected to a South American language family or another language family before somebody else opposed it. So that's kind of how that goes. Um, culturally, definitely there are strong ties to the South American banana, yuca, staples, and the Caribbean side as opposed to the more corn-related cultures of the Aztec and Maya and, and Northern, the Nahuatl peoples. Uh, geographic distribution, so farthest north was up into El Salvador and, and areas of Honduras, I guess all the way up to the mouth of the Patuca River in Honduras, which would be the north coast of Honduras on the Caribbean. Um, and primarily in Nicaragua, in the kind of the northeastern corners where they have stayed, although at one time they covered maybe more than two-thirds of the country of Nicaragua. Um, Lifestyle, as I mentioned, more of the South American, so bark cloth was their traditional clothing. Um, much like the Northwestern Amazon Basin, they all make bark cloth. Um, dugout canoes for transportation, round, in this case, round thatched huts or houses with dirt floors was a traditional style um, with like a platform to sleep on. Um, the structure is very loose, not like a, a, a society that is used to building large temples and all like the agrarian societies of the northern indigenous peoples in Mexico and, and Guatemala, but more of the hunter-gatherer um, structure of regional gatherings where marriages would take place and um, feasts and partying would take place and also disputes would be settled and so on. But essentially each patriarchal family clan would have their own area on a river and all be spread out across a territory. So consequently uh, one of the results of this is the linguistic variation. So you tend to have regional dialects in which are kind of a continuum. On one end you have one tendency, on the other end you have the opposite tendency and everything else is somewhere in between. Um, very common throughout, throughout uh, Central and South America. Um, belief system, so animism, 
is the basic, their basic worldview. Um, essentially, spiritual be spirit beings are negative in connotation. They're causing sickness, they're causing death. Uh, some people have powers to manipulate them. And they're found in all the natural elements. So natural elements I'm speaking about particularly, there are those that reside in the water systems, in the waters, those that reside in the air, be associated with hurricanes, with phenomena like that. And there are those that reside in the deep forest um, and would be associated with evil that befalls a hunter or, or someone else who, who penetrates into the, into the deep forest. The rainforest environment. Uh, History of contact, just quickly. So, Spanish on the west, British on the east. Uh, Spanish starting in the early 1500s, British uh, to the 1600s. Uh, primarily the privateers who preyed on the Spanish shipping. They the, the British in the east allied themselves with the Miskito people, which were a mixed dominant people of the Caribbean region that ranged all the way from Belize to South America and in certain cases along the Costa Rican coast and into Panama. They were a, a warlike mixed people that kind of took on or absorbed all the small coastal peoples along the coast of Nicaragua and Honduras at one time. And they soon became the marauders inland as well and provided the English with slaves for the West Indies, sugar plantations, and those slaves were largely at certain periods, largely Mayangna people. So during this period, the Mayangna were decimated. They went from covering maybe two thirds of Nicaragua to being just a few little surviving members in the deepest parts of the forest. Um, the Moravians were the first to come and, and try to uh, reach the indigenous peoples of the Caribbean side of Nicaragua and they had missions also, well that started in the West Indies, I think that's the one that we're most familiar with as the first non-Jesuit attempt at mission efforts, first Protestant mission effort uh, to the island of St. Thomas. I won't go into it, you can look it up. Um, they made it to Nicaraguan coast in 1846. They made it to the Waspuk River. So Was is, is river or water, and Puk is also the word, is also a root word that we use to say darkness, Puksani, or nighttime, Pukta. Um, so it's a dark water river. Common to rainforest areas, you have a lot of leaf matter and you have acidic soils and the, the release of the tannin of the leaves in the water, and you have these dark rivers, common in the in, this, in South America as well. Um, the Dark Water River area, uh, they did reach that area in about 1921. So my wife's family in the territory where I lived most of the time and worked most of the years I worked with the Mayangna people are all from this, this area of the country. And um, her grandfathers were children on both sides of the first native pastors. So her great-grandfathers were ones who first had contact with Moravian missionaries and converted from their traditional lifestyle. That's pretty recent um, in their history. And um, that generation all died during the 80s refugee experience during the 80s Contra Sandinista War when the whole territory of Mayangna people uh, were forced into exile with the clothes on their backs to Honduras and lived out the conflict there and buried all their old people there, either on the trail or there. So by my wife's generation, we have this much contact with Christianity. Um, great grandfather, grandfather, child of first pastors, father and mother, um, somewhat raised by grandparents who had that first contact with the Moravian missionaries and teaching, in-depth teaching and largely grew up in the church that resulted. Uh, the western side of the, of the Mayangna territories is quite different. There the Moravian made it um, in the 1930s and 40s uh, with some contact, but it didn't take much root because the Catholic uh, church was already there. So there was one church founded there and uh, actually uh, <coughs> Robbins was uh, one of my wife's 
uh, names, last names, he was one of the first pastors to work in the Bokai River. So here's a couple pictures of the Mayangna typical lifestyle. Uh, this, is, this house style is inherited from the Moravians, from their teaching to have a house on stilts and with a wood floor and framework. The thatch is, is traditional and she's pounding rice there in the picture to remove the hull. Washing clothes in the river on a stone. And let's think about their Bible situation. So the church, we realized the Moravian church came in in, say, 1921, I believe. Um, those dates are a little bit approximate because there were different contexts, but tried to kind of focus on the key periods. Um, by 1935, the Moravian church had, in the Mosquito language, the warfaring dominant people of the region that had absorbed all the smaller peoples, they had a New Testament and they had a hymn book with their liturgy. Um, at this point in the Moravian Church's history, this is the Moravian Church as of its merger with Lutheranism in, or Pietistic Lutheranism in southern Germany in about uh, 1730s. And so it's a liturgical church with infant baptism, with close communion, and with kind of a mix of Protestant and Reformation theology, with a hint of its origins from the more Anabaptist line of things from John Huss. So they were generally pacifistic, as we're familiar with in this country. And, um, would have some concept of separation of church and state. But essentially, the, their, their structure at this point is, is that of a, may I say, a high church structure, like a, a major Protestant denomination, with bishops and districts and reverends and pastors and very organized system. Um, the Moravian Church decided that the Mayangna people were too small, too broken up into little dialect groups and regions, hard to define where one dialect ended, another began, and that it, they would just use the Miskito language to, to reach them, to work with them. So essentially, this was a decision because at this point in Nicaragua's history, um, the only education that's going on in this region of the country is by the Moravian Church. The only medi medical system functioning in this part of the country is through the Moravian Mission. The only trade system that's functioning in this part of the country is through the Moravian Mission. So this is pretty all-encompassing. Uh, every Moravian station has a store. There's some clinic connection, and it wasn't long before they started a flight service to move between regional hospitals and they basically provided what the indigenous people needed in, in this part of the country. Um, but this was a pretty major decision for the Mayangna people because education, church, everything associated with development of their language now has been decided to not occur, to not happen. Their language is destined to extinction, one would think. Um, but it didn't, it didn't die out, it continued to be the common language. And in the refugee camps in 1984, uh, by 1984, the refugee experience was from about 81 to 88. And um, during this period, there was some linguistic effort and a little sketch, grammatical sketch was done of the language. And a translation was done from the Miskito New Testament that the Moravians had done back in about 1900 or so. Um, and, whoops, I'm moving along here. The um, Bible that came in right before I went back into the communities for the first time in 1999 was the Bible that was translated in three, four, five years. I'm not totally sure the, the duration. This has three years up there, but it was translated from Dios Habla Hoy, which is a dynamic version of Spanish, um, copywritten, copyrighted by the 
Bible Society, and um, this project was carried out by the Nicaraguan Bible Society. Going to a little bit of history of the Bible and its situation, but before we go into much more of that, I'd like to talk a little bit about some other issues. Um, I'll just present one little glimpse here of what that translation can look like. Um, there are probably a lot of more poignant examples or more clear examples of problems within the translation, but this is one that um, I have, so we'll look at it. Uh, just if you want to open your Bible or, or turn to Genesis 2, 8 through 9, just to compare with me, I'm not going to read it for you in a version that you might trust. After that, Father, he that is Lord, and Lord in Mayangna is also the word for owner, in the land of Eden made a good place. Place has lots of uses by context. So it could be town, could be farm, location. He planted many different kinds of flowers. That was toward the east. And he put the man that he had created in there. Father made so, so the father, the, the idea of God, or their, their typical word, traditional word for God is, is father also. Papang as God, Papang as young Papang, okay, my father. Father made so that many good trees sprouted there, those produced fruits. So they were good to eat. And in the middle of that place, he also planted the tree of life. That tree was the tree of understanding good and evil. Do you notice anything there that kind of jumps out at you? How many trees do you think should have been in there? Is it one or two or three or is it a hybrid or anyway? I'll let you come to a conclusion there. Um, actually, in the Mayangna Moravian theology, current theology, as it has come to this generation, um, this is perfectly natural reading. Uh, in their concept, God made Adam, God made Eve, and he put them together, but they were not to cohabitate. So, God made Adam sin by, by obvious association or implication. There was no choice. He sinned. Um, that's a very basic concept in terms of morality viewed by the clergy and viewed by the church, that it's inevitable. Immorality is inevitable. Um, infidelity is inevitable. Um, so which came first? The misunderstanding of how God related to Adam and Eve and sin and whether God forced the sin on man or whether he was responsible or whether man was responsible for his own sin or how that came about. Did that come first or did the translation come first? Well, in this place, the, tr the understanding, the misunderstanding came first, but the translation was done by a man who was the first licensed theologian of the Mayangna people, native speaker of Mayangna, under the Moravian church. A seminary graduate, the first one, um, former revolutionary leader, um, head of a, a platoon or a, a group of revolutionary soldiers, um, former politician of some sort, and now turned Moravian theologian. Um, his family tradition would have been Catholic, it was the only Catholic church in that region. And um, he pretty much single-handedly did the Old Testament translation from a dynamic Spanish version. Um, the New Testament translation he turned over to his nephew who was going through college and needed an income source. And his nephew pretty much did an adaption translation between the 80s New Testament from the Mesquito version of the New Testament and the Dios habla hoy Spanish version, um, primarily focused on the Spanish dynamic translation. And that was largely another single-handed translation by a college student who was not a believer at the time, or a committed member of the Moravian Church even. So that was where we got our Bible from. Obviously, I didn't know all this in uh, 1999 or 2000, 2001. And so when these Bibles became available, 
at the Bible Society because they had not worked out as our previous presenter spoke about the promotion of it throughout the translation process, the, the connection with the people, the avenues for distribution, and so on, since they had not done that. And since the translators themselves were not people necessarily of great repute among their people, or well respected, and the translation process and design had not been followed accurately, so pastors and others who were supposed to have participation felt like they were sidelined, and this was kind of one man's project and one man's economic benefit in an area which has almost no cash circulating. Then there were lots of reasons why the people had a little resistance to just going out and purchasing it. And um, so the Bible Society had attempted to distribute this Bible through the translator's network. It hadn't worked and he had disappeared and he hadn't come back to Managua, to the capital city. They went out, tried to find him one time, gave up. And um, when I went to buy a, another couple of Bibles in 2000, I had purchased a couple in 99. When I went to buy a couple, they said, why are you buying this Bible? Nobody buys it. And from that began our involvement with this Bible, um, particularly. Uh, a fund was made available through Christian Aid Ministries. The Bible was purchased on condition that we would distribute it, and that took up a number of years, a lot of time, distributing this Bible all over these regions. Um, the, um, if we had known all we, had, all we know now, probably we wouldn't have purchased it. At the same time, I trust God is sovereign and He allows things and it did take us to every region of the country and it did provide us with contact with all the different groups of Mayangna people throughout Central America, throughout Honduras and Nicaragua. And um, it was literally a passport into many different communities where I'm not sure how else we would have gotten in. Closed territories, Catholic communities, and um, the fact that we had a Bible in their language meant that we were welcomed in, was able to speak in their, in their churches, in their communities. Um, they are waiting for another Bible. As of a couple years ago, my father-in-law traveled through the Bokai River to deliver the Bible storybook, which we're working on here. This was one of our initial translations, which actually got uh, dropped, and we did another translation. <laughs> Part of the process of learning with mother tongue translators in a language. Um, but this Bible storybook was completed, and just a couple years ago, we managed to get it to the Bokai River region, where the people thought he was coming with the Bible again. We had come through there in about 2003, and um, they were happy for the Bible storybook, but they really wanted the Bible. So what happened? Well, the Bible Society didn't do any more revisions of it. They didn't do any more translations, and it sat. Um, all attempts at communication didn't come through, and that's, and that's kind of where it went for all these years. I won't get in too much more into that, because I would like to talk more about what impact this whole Moravian church, no Bible, will use the Mesquito language to reach these people, what impact this had on their lives and what it produced. Um, Let's back up a little bit now and think about how the first, the first work was done. So if you don't have a common language, you have a largely monolingual people. At this point in time, back in the 1920s, the people were living almost exclusively in their traditional structure of little hamlets along the, the rivers, patriarchal clans. And um, what are you going to do? in the 1920s. Well, they developed a system of line drawings. Maybe this was something they'd worked with before in other groups. And so, as it was related to me by a man who has since passed away, who was about 10 or 12 when they came. Um, so he was, he remembers the old, um, before Moravian contact as a child, and he remembered the first services there. And um, he, st he said they used to have these little cards that they would give out for a service. And the people would take them home and look at them and think about what it might say, what it meant. So they would have a line drawing that was supposed to represent the Bible story. The people that were sitting and listening to the Mesquito teaching 
didn't understand a word of it, but they had their little card to look at and think about until next Sunday they get another card. Um, a lot of challenges there to communicate the message. Um, from there, you have a number of failures on the part of the early missionaries. There were a number of, after the first missionary that was an, an expat, um, Carlos Breganzer, after he was killed, um, the reasons for his death, there are different theories, but essentially the Mayangna story, which I would tend to give more credence to, is that there was a group of Mayangna who were envious of another group and the distribution and the access to the goods that were coming through the Moravian store and mission, clothing and cloth and food and so on. And they felt like they were getting the short end in their community. It wasn't evenly handed. And so they spoke to Sandino's rebel group who were against the Marine presence in Nicaragua at that time, if you are familiar with Nicaraguan history. And and Sandino's group with this Mayangna clan um, killed him. This would be a very typical situation in the Mayangna culture of envy between groups. Not a unified people, rather a fractured people. Um, after that, the Moravians never sent any more expat missionaries into this region. There were a couple more um, Miskito or Jamaican origin people that came in there. A couple, at least one of them had major moral failures. And then, um, and then that was it. And then they had native pastors trained and those continued the work. So the early Moravian Mayangna pastors would read from their Miskito Bible. Some of them would preach in Miskito because that was what they were taught to preach in, even though the people didn't understand it and the, so all the songs were in Miskito. So by the time I came along, I should just mention quickly, this is Patricio, my father-in-law, he's sitting here. This is in his little house where we worked. The, underneath the table was where I slept. And um, we were taking this picture largely because this was a novel experience. We we're working with a computer for the first time. Um, all our original work was done by hand. We'd write by hand and then write out clean sheets. We didn't have a typewriter and it was all by hand. Um, this is a picture of just the distribution. I'm sorry I'm jumping around a little bit, but this is the kind of transportation we used often, a balsa raft. Uh, we were paying for the distribution through sales of hymn books and Bibles. These are a couple of Costa Rican volunteers on the end of the raft with the little white hats typical Costa Rican country attire, and a Miskito lady and her Mayangna husband on the other end. Traveling down river, we had about 1,500 pounds of books on that raft, and it, the whole trip took us about a month and a half. Here's the Musawas um, Moravian Church. This is the largest community. This community was founded by the Moravians as they brought all these little clans that were Lower River and Upper River together to settle in one spot so that they could have a church and they could have a school. And eventually they actually had an airstrip there. And this was gonna be the center for this territory. Um, when you break up a, a society's normal structuring, you end up with interesting situations. So this is the first Mayangna city, you could say. Each neighborhood is a clan. The clan structure never ended. It just now is clan structure without any space between. You can imagine. <laughs> Tensions, um, rivalries, and so on, but now with house to house. Um, So what happened with animism when we have no Bible, we have no foundational teaching of a different worldview like Steve so, so clearly presented to us yesterday that there's this grid, he used the example of the idea of a grid with different pieces of their worldview, if you remember from yesterday. Well, what happened with the Mayangna grid and Christianity now 
without a language in common to understand it, without a creation through teaching to grasp where the cross comes in, starting with just a New Testament in another language, but a whole church structure to support it. Um, essentially, what happened in this case is that the part of the grid that for the Mayangna people was the least defined is where Christianity fit. So what might be the least defined part of your grid if you're an animistic people? Probably the part that you uh, have the least control over. What's, what's one area that we don't have much control over? Death. And what happens after it? So conveniently, Christianity brought in a solution to that quandary. Dealing with the spirits in this life, this was daily life. This was normal. This was just the way you did things. You, you worried about um, whether there was a rainbow. You'd hide your children from the rainbow or not let them point at it. Um, you worried about all the different taboos related to um, anything and everything. <laughs> related to how you planted your crops, related to how you built your house, related to um, how you related in your family. Um, traditionally, in my young enough families, a uh, son-in-law with a mother-in-law, they could never meet, they could never see each other. They would avoid each other completely. Um, all kinds of just details of how you live. And these things you don't think about in an animistic culture, it's just passed on from generation to generation, and this is how it works. Um, so when Christianity came and they had very developed system for how to treat disease with witchcraft, with uh, shamanism, uh, they would come from the, the belief system of the, basically a shaman who's the headman of the clan or the village. Um, he's also, maybe you've heard the term a fire walker or someone who goes into, would walk on fire, walk in burning wood or work, walk on coals. Um, my wife's great-grandmother uh, used to have to prepare the wood for the chief to go in and walk on the fire because it had to be a girl before pu puberty that would prepare the fire. Now, every detail is defined in your life. We tend, from our culture, to look at an indigenous people and we look at what looks like disorder to us. It looks like confusion. It looks like a lack of discipline, a lack of, you know, just we can't make sense out of it. And we tend to think that they just kind of go about life however it comes. It's absolutely not true. Every detail is, is thought about, every detail, not thought about in a sense of objectively, thought about in the sense of how we do it, how we deal with it. Um, so with a shamanistic background, with the relationship to the, nat the, nat the natural elements as not a creation of God which he controls, but rather inhabited by and owned by the different spirits that want to wreak havoc on you, that want to make you sick, that, that are continually requiring you to do things to appease them so that you can survive, so that you can get a crop, so that, you can, so that your child will not die from dysentery or pneumonia or whatever. Um, breaking any taboo, obviously, you bring it on yourself, right? So it's a fear of death associated with all these taboos. Um, What happens with Christianity? Well, this is, this is a... It's really interesting. Every people's going to take things different ways, right? So, in the Mayangna culture, it's very different from the Hoti. Don't think about the Hoti at all. <coughs> Talking about envious, fractured, um, somewhat violent, except for one area. I'm not familiar with maybe any case of suicide in the years I've known them which is very different from a lot of indigenous peoples. Um, in the Belizean Kekchi culture, suicide is the most common form of death often among young people. 
So you can have total extremes, one people to another. Never think that this people is like that people because they look the same. <laughs> um, I was trying to figure out early on as we were working with the mother tongue translators, our, our situation was that we were welcomed in on their terms. So initially, I couldn't even stay in the territory. I could just go in and take some documents in in simplified Spanish. They could translate them. Our initial effort in translation was simply to provide them with some simple Bible studies and inspirational stories and things that would be as much as possible adapted to their environment to help them engage the Bible that they now had. This is all before we realized what condition the Bible was in that they now had. <laughs> um, and so this was basically a little family paper. If you're familiar with the La Antorcha de la Verdad, the Torch of Truth paper published out of Costa Rica, it was, it was built on that pattern, but a, a unique um, addition for the Mayangna people. So they were mother tongue translators. It was their committee. They were heading it up. And I took documents in and out. And eventually they invited me in to, to help them as like a, a translator's facilitator. I knew how to handle a, a concordance. I knew how to handle a Vines Expository Dictionary. I had more familiarity with the themes. And helped them figure out you know, what is it trying to say in Spanish. As they realized that even in Spanish they really were not getting it. And they didn't know how to communicate it in their language. So that gave me a lot of interaction, allowed me to learn the language. It wasn't long before they allowed me to be their secretary and write everything down as they translated. That was a great school there to learn the language. And um, eventually, different things occurred. And the traditional way we were translating was broken up because a new reverend came in and he took our translation house and decided we couldn't have it anymore. And he took our library. and. He uh, disbanded it, essentially. Um, so we moved to working with each translator that we had been working with um, in their own homes. So I would go to one community and live there for a month, maybe. And others would, other translators would come as they could, and we would work together in a group. And otherwise, I'd work with the one translator and I'd move around during this period. And I was in the community of Alal. That's where this picture was taken. Um, that's the congregation there. And if you can notice some little white, it's a little bit blurry here. These are their veilings. The Moravian tradition brought a veiling from Europe. It gradually changed until it was a doily at this point. Um, had no significance whatsoever, except for that this is what you do when you go to church, just like any other taboo in your system. You don't have to know why. You don't have to have any basis for it. If there's an authority behind it, and this is what you do, that's what you do. You don't ask. Um, in this community, while I was staying with um, a translator, Asuncion, he's down here and right here, and one of his sons, or two of his sons are in front of him. His youngest son, Timothy, became very sick. He was just uh, about a year and a half or so old, maybe close to two, and um, came down with dysentery. And he was very quickly becoming dehydrated, and it looked like they were going to lose him. I just would quickly mention the conditions we're living in so you get a little idea how intimate the relationship is. It was approximately 12 by 16 foot house and six children, and a whole rice crop of 30 sacks or so in one side. And um, I slept with the children. You just always want to make sure you're kind of on the uphill end of the plank, <laughs> just in case. Um, board floor. And um, anyway, so if somebody has dysentery, well, it's, it's there. It's, it's everywhere. It's, it's cleaned up right away, but, you know, limitations and uh, not a lot of space. And um, the, um, I was praying about this, how to deal with it. I was trying, I was trying to figure out how they deal with the sickness. What, what, what does it mean to them? 
how do, you, how do they relate to it? There, there was a nurse in the community that was around sometimes. Sometimes she had some medicine. Um, she was actually part of kind of a rival patriarchal clan from theirs in the same community. Um, so they weren't particularly friendly with each other, but she was there and she was my young man. But they didn't go there. Right away they assumed that it was because the older daughter had taken the son down to the river in the evening when he was washing clothes and had given him a bath and should never have done that because Liwa had gotten him. And Liwa is actually from Miskito language, but um, the Mayangna version is Wasmuhine. The idea is like a, the spirit of the water, essentially. That the spirit of the water had, had gotten him, and that's why you have dysentery, water, right? Close association. And um, so it began with one person who had a, who was someone they would refer to as a, a ditaliang or a seer, someone who could see beyond that which most of us can see, see into the unknown, see into the spirit world. Um, that's basically what that means. Ditaliang is literally thing, he who sees, or seer, as the old English would have had it. And um, as Timothy gets sicker and sicker, and I get more and more desperate to find a solution and to, I, I begin to take my translator companion through, through James and talk about the idea of praying for the sick and that God has authority over sickness. God has authority over our physical condition and what happens to us as well as believers in Him. It's a totally foreign concept. And my translator friend is a Moravian elder who has gone through pastoral training. And um, so this is a real eye-opener to me. Um, at this point, I was somewhat conversational in Mayangna. I wasn't fluent, so we were bouncing back and forth between Spanish and Mayangna some of the time. Uh, he was very fluent in Spanish with a father of mixed heritage. So um, at one point in the afternoon, he goes off to the farm, and for some reason, I stayed behind and worked on something. And when he's coming back, um, he's, he's standing down below, splitting some firewood, and I'm sitting on the little porch, and he says, you know, I've been thinking about it, what you're, what you're telling me about, about uh, my son's sickness and all. He said, said you're, you're a white person, and I'm an Indian. And white people believe in pills, and they fear things they call bacteria that they can't see. And Indians, I, I, sorry, did I say fear pills? I meant fear bacteria, and they use pills to deal with the, the sickness, the bacteria. Bacteria being things that they can't see, they just call them that. And Indians fear spirits, and they use leaves and plants and other things that um, they know will ward off or, or cause, the, um, cause the sickness to go away. We're just the same. Just different way of dealing with it. And um, I told him, well, you're very, you're very right on the, on the white people side of things. My grandmother would never live outside of a big city or far away from a hospital. But she doesn't believe in God. She's not a believer. She believes in modern medicine. She believes in science and whatever they say, she tells us to. If you have to eat margarine, you eat margarine. You have to eat butter, you eat butter. Whatever comes along, that's what you do. That's science. You change because your health is first and you shouldn't be where I am, way off in the bush. And um, she tells me that every time I see her. So as you're right, a white person without God thinks much like an Indian without God. But if we believe in God, then it changes for both white and Indian. And as I began to talk to him about that, he, he was puzzled. It didn't make sense to him. And he said, well, he said, you see, he said, we see God differently. God to us is like a snake. And that floored me because I, my association between snakes is, and a spirit being is definitely not with God, right? Um, but his, this was his example. He said, we know the snake is in the bush, and we go on our trail, and we know he's out there. 
but we don't see him. But someday we know we're going to run into him. The poisonous snake. There's a very feared poisonous snake in the, in the region that's very common, called the, referred to often as the fer de lance or the lance head, which is aggressive and deadly and very common. So, said so the snake's out there, we know we'll run into him someday. So that's the way we look at God. He's out there, he's around, he exists, but we will run into him someday when we die. Until then, we do, as we've always done, we relate to the spirits and we relate to the bush medicine and, and the, the Italian. Well, that gave me a good start on figuring out what Papa might mean to them, what God might mean to them. So here's pastorally trained Moravian elder. His conception of God fits into that little square which has to do with after death. Not in this life. Um, Timothy did live. God did provide. He allowed me to get the same dysentery and I was able to figure out which medicine took care of it and get the medicine to him before he became too dehydrated. So he actually did make it and he's a young man now. Um, sometimes the cure is painful. Sometimes we have to figure it out first. But God does answer prayer. Just not how we expect. Um, beyond that, I'd just like to think a little bit quickly about what another aspect of this animistic bondage in relation to everyday life and health. So another aspect of sickness for them is that Sickness is always caused, right? So if it's not the spirits, then what might it be? Another Mayanga. And if you have a lot of rivalry between clans and a lot of jealousies and so on, you assume without doubt that somebody doesn't like you. And you know most of the time who it is. So basically all death to them is caused by what is commonly referred to from an English borrowing through Miskito, trik, trik maimunna, trik, trik kalmunna. So, from trick. Um, it's also referred to as, um, in, other, in other terms, but that's the, the most common kind of the street language. And um, basically, every death causes a new rivalry causes a new hatred, a new, a new spot with another group, with another family. And it can happen within families where another member in the family. At one point I had to shelter my, um, at that time he wasn't my brother-in-law, but a, an older brother of Anissa's for a few months because he was being accused of his cousin's death. And the boy's father was, was uh, threatening to kill him. You see the bondage, you see the pain that this, these, this belief system cause, causes. And this is within the Moravian church. This is, this is, these are all church people. Um, this here is a picture of a casket being carried. The person in that casket is my wife's aunt. She died from appendicitis. Perfectly preventable if caught in time. But since the first assumption is that somebody has worked witchcraft on you, then the first place you go is not the hospital, is not the doctor, but to a ditalia. And he does, he goes through his rituals, whether it's candles or water or all different things they use to try to figure out um, who did it and where the evil is coming from and then they claim that they have the solution and so on. And um, so much precious time is wasted. A uh, very common occurrence for young women to die in childbirth with a clinic in the same community or with a hospital within walking distance even. Because you exhaust everything possible first on your basic assumption based on your worldview and then maybe as a last resort, well, if they're going to die anyway, well, we'll go to the hospital. I don't know how many deaths I've witnessed from this. Um, it would take a long time to count them all. Thinking about 
now trying to translate, trying to work with this group quickly. We only have a few minutes left, but try to think about some of that, some of those challenges. So as I began to wake up to the fact that not only do we have a problem in the Bible translation, we also have a problem with our terminology. So what do we do for key terms? Because now we have all these borrowings. So for example, communion is tibilani, a combination of two English words borrowed through mosquito. Um, tibil is table. La is the original English la, but with a different connotation. Basically anything abstract. It can be combined with any idea that's kind of abstract. So this is the, this is the right. This is the, this is what you do under this kind of authority structure. There's still an idea of authority. This is the church authority and, and this is communion. Dibilani, the, the right of the table. Um, comes, what comes before that, since Moravians have a closed communion, um, what comes before that is speaking. Speaking is from speaking. And it's the idea of confession. Um, not, not that different from a lot of Anabaptist practice of having this kind of confessional with, in, some, some do it more in a public, some do it more in a private way. But communion at this point is not remember that remembering thing, that eating and remembering thing, like Steve talked about. Communion at this point is a direct avenue of connection with God, grace to you, from God that's administered by the church. It's sacramental. So the Catholic concept. You know, if you can make it to communion, you've got it secured for a while. It's not a relationship with God, it's, it's, it's this way of getting a hold of God, getting something from God, getting that security from God through the church. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. We could go down through probably any different aspect of normal church terminology. And we have some confusion of borrowings and its application today. Uh, if we talk about the different entities in the Bible. So we could think about the idea of Satan, the idea of evil spirits, the idea of, uh, we already talked a little bit about Papa and God and that confusion with their concept of God. And then we could go on down through the whole spirit world and the relationship between the spirit world and the physical world and we have massive confusion everywhere. Um, some of this has been kind of hidden in the translation, probably a sense of um, probably from different aspects of the struggle that the translator was going through as a Moravian theologian who continues to adhere to the traditional Mayangna animistic worldview. So if you go to, for example, the, the account of Saul with the Witch of Endor, um, you'll find that Ditalian is not used there. There's a kind of hodgepodge translation from Spanish which means nothing for the lady there. And um, the Italian is exactly what she was. She was the classic picture of, in our older English, a seer. One of, who related to familiar spirits, spirits known to her. The, the whole concept of familiar spirits fits with the whole old English way of looking at ghosts and seers and so on. The, so, then what do we do with spirit? So, current usage in my young today is uh, in the Moravian churches, piri. Where did that come from? Spirit. <laughs> which came from Latin spiritus, which came from a translation from Greek neoma, which came from the idea of Hebrew ruach, breath of air, wind. And now it made it to Mayangna, but it has no meaning, has no connection, except for as what's ascribed to it by the Moravian Church. So do we use it or not? Um, so Satan, what do we do with Satan? So we have Satan, Satanas, Satan, um, Dibil, Diablo, you know, all scattered throughout the Bible. 
some from Spanish, some from English via Misquito. And maybe in a couple of cases you have Ulasa and Walasa. So Ulasa would be from Misquito and Walasa from Mayanga. So who's who and who does what and who connects to whom and very confusing. That was my first task in, in working with a translation that they had done was try to figure out which spelling was right. And often I had five spellings for one word. So I thought, well, I'll use the Bible, right? This is the only body of literature that we have in the language that's large and covers these topics. I can just go to the Bible, find the verses where these words are found, and it should be fine. No. <laughs> um, we ended up struggling with the whole spiritual concept for a long time. And finally we realized we had to just take it on and deal with these words. We couldn't borrow stuff. It was just causing more confusion. Um, we need to somehow connect them to the idea. The handle th that had come down through the Moravian Church wasn't connecting, wasn't allowing the Bible's teaching to speak into their culture in a way that they could interpret it as meaningful, as um, confront their culture. It wasn't engaging their culture. It was just two different levels. It was two different realms. It was church and then the rest of life. So you go take care of the stuff for after death, every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Friday. You're a communicant member. You haul the pastor around when he has to go places. You tithe. You provide the pastor with firewood, with food. You work the church plantation for the pastor or farm. Uh, you pay the church's membership in, to the regional synod, to the, to the bishop. You make all the promise payments, and you're, you're good. You're, you're all set. And then if someone passes away, they'll watch as they die to see if they have a bad fever, to see what they say in a delirium, anything like that, that would indicate whether they're going to hell or going to heaven. Or if somebody is, uh, um, goes unconscious through a bad fever or through a sickness, they would do what they call tun sitnin, you know, um, tie something around their head, around their eyes, so they can't see, and and see what they say in a delirium or in a in an out of conscious state, and expect to get inspiration or direction or know who did what to whom or who's bad in the church or you know all this is associated with with the um, the confusion of an animistic Christian church, and. Um, so we, as we began to search for how to deal with these names, how to, how to produce something that engages with them, dealing with the, the concept of spirit became critical, and we had an inspiration from some structures within the same language. So as we were trying to figure this out, realized that the whole idea of muy, which is person, can combine with other ideas to, f to describe different states or different, uh, different beings. So an insect is dimui, thing, thing person, thing body. Um, dimuihini is meat. Um, and in a common expression used by the people to refer to why they did failed at something, why they um, sinned or why they had done a wrong deed was salmuihini. Earth, person, I am. So we began to thinking about this and think about the concept of spirit and we began to play around with what could we do to create the concept of a non-earth person? What would that look like? And we came up with the idea of wingmui, borrowing from the Hebrew concept of the, the picture that the Lord gives us of the air and how it can represent the idea of an invisible force, an invisible power, an invisible person, not visible to our, to our state of existence here in the earth. And um, it was fascinating to see how once those two words came together to form a new, a new concept, it, it was immediately understood. You could insert it in a message in the church, you could insert it in a text, so pick it up and read it and say, wing wing, oh yeah, not so wing wing. Not earth person, air person. Not physical. And um, that was just one 
really exciting breakthrough for us. Since then, we've worked with a lot of other terminology. Um, but we found that due to this whole mix, this whole confusion that's coming down from starting with no Bible in the language, no translation ever in the language, and a strong animistic culture that it has produced a church lingo which does not represent the biblical concepts. So there's actually a whole group of words which maybe could have been used, maybe could have been borrowed, but at this point immediately have a different connotation. And you get into the idea of salvation and it's even worse, and I'm going to take two minutes yet to do that, I think I can. Um, because salvation is a really core concept for Christianity. <laughs> and Jesus says that there's one way, that he's the door. But in the Mayangna Moravian theology, there are many ways. So when my wife's uncle was killed, was beaten to death in the major town nearby, largely over land issues, and his role in protecting the territory. Um, tragic death. He, was, he may have been drinking some that evening. He did have trouble with binge drinking. But tragic nonetheless. And Patricio, my father-in-law, was not... He was, he was doubly sad, fearing for his brother's soul. His brother wasn't married. He had abandoned his previous wife through a sickness situation. She had had some kind of epilepsy or something that made her unable to take care of the family and he had abandoned her and very sad story and ended up living with another woman and he was going to town and he said he was going to go to town and his previous, his actual wife had passed away by then. He was going to go to town and he was going to straighten things up. He was going to go ahead and take the steps to get married to the woman he was living with. But that night he died. He was killed. Well, from the Moravian Mayangna theology, he was saved through being killed that way. Because when you kill somebody violently, all that person's sins come on you. So that person has a ticket to heaven. So people that have a violent reputation and lead a disorderly life will often be heard commenting, basically, the gist of, I have to get myself killed to get to heaven. Um, another way is through a combination of sorrow and good deeds. So there's a tragic story of a man who was married to one girl in a family. This is many years ago that it occurred and he started an affair with her younger sister and to cover up his affair he killed his wife and it was obvious there was no way to hide it and this was actually my mother-in-law's aunt that he killed and this man has had a long life and now his daughter becomes pregnant, out of wedlock, has a miscarriage, and nearly dies and is, gets through the whole situation. And then he takes the baby and buries the baby, the miscarried baby from his daughter's out of wedlock relationship. Through this act and the sorrow that their family experienced, it's believed that he, his sins were washed away from having murdered his wife. How? But when you have no foundation, the Bible doesn't make any sense. There are more ways, but I won't go into all of them. But I praise God for the truth of Jesus Christ and its liberation. I wanted to tell you about my brother-in-law's recent conversion, but I think we'll, we'll save that for another time. I just want to say that despite all of this, despite 
generations of lies and deceit in Satan's power and Satan's dominance of a Christian religion and use of it to further deceive and further entrap because now the people not only have animism to work through but they also have the fact that they believe that their salvation is based on their allegiance and loyalty to the Moravian church and that was the main accusation against my in-laws when they were first baptized as believers was you're going to hell you've left the Moravian church you've taken on another baptism you're going to hell there's no salvation for you it's a little picture of what can happen what we want to avoid through faithful Bible translation coupled with church planting.